Welcome to the Elevate the Vibe podcast, bringing you juicy convos with thought leaders discussing the wild world of parenting. I was never deliberate about anything in college. And so given that I work with high school kids, the wisdom that I try to give them is put some things into place before you go. Be intentional about how you want to make choices about your daily life, because we don't have training in this. Nobody gets the class, the crash course that's actionable. That's like, here's some baseline information on nutrition or here's how to exercise. It's devoid of any formal education. So I think most people fail until they figure it out. And our hope is that we can provide even like little nuggets of wisdom to make kids feel a bit more in control of those choices that they make. What up, Vibe Hive? Happy Wednesday. It's Jay. It's Katie. It's a brand new episode of the Elevate the Vibe podcast, and you should be psyched. Why, Shug, should they be psyched? Vibe Hive, your prayers have been answered. We finally have a guest. Praise Jesus. I know that... You've really loved 5,000 solo episodes from Jason and I, but today we have Jill and Dave Henry joining us. They are authors of The Greatest College Health Guide You Never Knew You Needed, and it was a pleasure to sit down with them and dive into the reasons that they decided to publish this book. Man, they're like the coolest people I think I've ever e-met. They're like so rad. I mean, they honestly reminded me just of me and you, Shug, which is probably why I think they're awesome. Because we are awesome? <laughs> uh, to give you a little backstory on Jill and Dave, Jill and Dave Henry are the married couple behind the clever, hilarious, and practical book. I already said the title, but I'll say it again. The Greatest College Health Guide You Never Knew You Needed. How to Manage Food booze, stress, sex, sleep, and exercise on campus. The book is so great. I might go back to school after this show. I'll be honest with you. Damn, UCLA, watch out. (laughs) Jill and Dave both coach high school sports, and this book was inspired by their senior athletes who confessed that they were worried about the transition to college. And regardless if you're a high schooler, a parent to a child who's headed to college, or someone who's a fan of research-backed tips to manage your health, this book is a one-stop resource you can turn to. And Vibe Hive, as a little extra special treat, we're going to do a giveaway for Jill and Dave's book. Leave a comment on our most recent Instagram post. You will see it as the giveaway post. Tag a friend, and we will send two lucky winners signed copies of the book from Jill and Dave themselves. You will also wish that you were going back to college if you're not headed to college when you read this book. So Vibe Hive, let's welcome Jill and Dave to the show. Jill, Dave, welcome to the Elevate the Vibe podcast. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourselves, where you're from, a little introduction, and uh, yeah, what the hell you're doing here? Yeah, man. <laughs> you want to go? Sure. So uh, we, we are married, in case anybody was curious. We're not just sitting right next to each other. And we actually met coaching high school sports. Jill is a high school math teacher and girls cross country coach. Uh, While I work in film and TV, I had a period of time where I was like, I need something for my soul. So I started coaching high school football again. And it led me to my wife. um, And meeting at that school at that time had its own kind of fun, like we were in a rom-com, but with adults in PE clothes and just a lot of teenagers pointing and like everybody wanted this thing to happen. Like the whole school was pretty invested in it. Um, And it worked out, thank God. (laughs) So I've been working in film and TV as an editor and producer for the past 12 years, Um, mainly documentary, reality TV, a couple teen driven melodrama, think like Dawson's Creek meets the hill style things for Snapchat. We got split screens, it's vertical. <laughs> <laughs> yep. uh, that's kind of a quick background of, of where my skill set lies. And then I've just been working in the high school sector for 15 years. And um, when our son was born four years ago, stopped teaching full time. And so stay at home with him and balance that with uh, coaching still and some summer teaching and writing this book. So that's sort of where we are at right now. And we're both based out of LA. All right. So you mentioned writing this book and you also mentioned your connection still to people that are high school age. I would say young adults, teens, young adults and teens. So talk to us a little bit about your book. Give us the title 
and the catalyst that really propelled you forward to want to write this? Yeah. So the title of the book is called The Greatest College Health Guide You Never Knew You Needed. Um, it wasn't our first choice of title, but it has all of the buzzwords in it. And so we <laughs> we went for it. Um, the catalyst was really the girls that I coach in cross country. Um, they, one particular girl, last race of this girl's senior year, she didn't have any other sports. And so when cross country ended, she was done with high school athletics and was already smartly analyzing the fact that the end of organized athletics sort of meant that the responsibility of getting exercise or taking care of herself was sort of all hers now and facing down the impending transition to college. And so, um, really expressed some concern about taking care of herself and her particular concern was the freshman 15. And so her exact words were coach, how do I not get fat in college? Um, which was actually how to not get fat in college was the original title of the book we wanted. And everyone was like, no, 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 you can't do that. Like, we were like, well, that's what she said. Um, but oh, man. yeah, yeah, we tried. Um, but, but anyway, so, you know, I talked to other senior girls on my team and it turned out they had varying concerns. Some were concerned about the transition, you know, with mental health and some were concerned about the physical repercussions. Dave's football players had the same stuff. So it was, you know, the kids are smart enough to recognize that they were going to be facing a pretty dramatic shift. Um, and that wasn't something I was aware of at that age. And so you have to give them credit for at least knowing what they're getting into. Our, our intention initially was just to help by finding something that already existed I don't think either of us ever intended to write a book, um, but what we ended up finding was that there was there was a lot of information, but it was all kind of scattered. A lot of it read pretty clinically because the probably the best resources exist on college websites on these wellness tabs, but they have a responsibility to have it be worded in a pretty professional way. Um, and so we sort of saw a chance to repackage it and repurpose it and make it feel a little bit more youthful and engaging. Um, but again, you know, I thought, I think we originally thought like maybe it's a packet of information and we made a joke at one point to my team. We were like, there's so much information here. We could, we could literally write a book. And one of the kids will never forget where we were sitting when she said it, she was like, you guys should do it. Um, and so that, you know, that night, I think we were brushing our teeth and we were like, should we, should we actually do this? Um, <laughs> and th the universe works in, you know, mysterious ways. And two weeks later, I found out that I was pregnant. And so we sort of turned my maternity leave and his paternity leave into an opportunity to free up some time and space and take a crack at it. And so that was five years ago. So it, you know, it took a long time, um, but that it, it was always rooted in like, let's help these kids we know. And if it reaches kids beyond that, cool. I don't think we ever even thought that we would get it published. The initial intention was maybe self-publishing, um, but it, it garnered enough attention and it's sort of landed us in this place where we have a book published and that feels pretty wild in and of itself. So um, it has been a cool journey here. Yeah. And, and again, the, the problem became pretty clear right off the bat, which is that this information's available. It's on websites. It's all over the place, but it's not connecting with the people that need it, right? And so part of that is the tone in which all of this stuff reads. It's not like you're like, oh, I've got a cold. Let me go pull up all these uh, medical studies and get to the bottom of this. You know, you want somebody to contextualize the information, to make it engaging, to make it fun uh, as much as possible so that you keep reading and you keep kind of learning. And then the other problem is that while available, it was so scattered all over the place. So to be able to consolidate this into one place that you could give to any kid going off to college. And essentially with the note that like, hey, taking care of yourself on your own is hard, regardless of how old you are. So this is a package for you that will cover everything you need to know in order to start that process of learning. How am I gonna take care of myself? So that was kind of the impetus. And as adults, I mean, even if you're not going out to college, it's still a journey. Nobody has it figured out. So like you said, taking all this information from different sources and pulling that together in a way that's palatable and digestible for your target audience, which could be teens going off to college, but then also as parents, like I was reading through this and I was like, this is really good. It's very relatable. Like, and I was laughing like within the first minute. Yeah. I was like, this totally is really, too. This I mean, is really I, well I could not throw a football to save my life, but I still felt like I was in your shoes there for a couple of <laughs> minutes. <laughs> 
I want to talk about when you both were heading off to school. So Jill, you mentioned like, you know, you, you were not necessarily thinking about this, but when you did transition from, you know, a high school student who maybe did have more structure into a college student and college lifestyle, what was that like for both of you? And how did you personally feel? And then looking back, think like, wow, how could I have used this resource now? Totally. I think, I think my issue was that I, from 18, I'm super a type. And I feel like from like 18, probably 16, I was planning my life. Like I had every step planned out and I was like, this is where I'm going to move. And this is where I'm going to live. And this is what I'm going to do. And it was just, it was always so future oriented and never present oriented. Um, and I think, you know, reflecting back on it, as we were writing this book, it was like, I missed an opportunity to really dial into where am I now and what can I do now that's within my power to sort of set myself up to be successful in the moment. And I think so much of my college career and my roommates will tell you, cause I was like half the time was a total buzzkill and was like, well, we gotta be professional and I gotta get my resume ready. And just like, no fun. Um, but you know, balance the line between being that and then being totally reckless. So I was I don't, I just didn't have it figured out. I mean, who does at that age? But I think if I had had a better sense of just how to provide some structure for myself and some routines and even an understanding of the fact that like you can create routines, you don't have to just be swept up into whatever current seems to be, you know, dragging by you at that point. I was never deliberate about anything in college um, with anything that I picked up. I think it was by happenstance rather than choice. And so, you know, if, who knows? I, the way I did things landed me here and that's great. But I think had, given that I work with high school kids, the wisdom that I try to give them is put some things into place before you go, be intentional about how you want to make you know choices about your daily life um, when you get there, because that sort of self-care will set you up to manage all of it. It's going to be chaotic regardless, but it's about like being your own home base and being able to like disconnect and be like, am I doing the best I can to keep my foundation steady? Um, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't able to connect any of those dots uh, to be frank, probably until my late twenties by just completely failing over and over again and being very extreme about it, getting into these patterns of like, I'm going to lock everything down and then falling off. And it gave me the ability to reflect on that and write this book in a way that felt relatable. Cause I think that is the experience most of us have. And if you think about why that is, it's because you said it, Katie, like we don't have training in this. Nobody gets the class, the crash course that's actionable. That's like, here's some baseline information on nutrition that doesn't have anything to do with biology. Like you wouldn't get it in a science class. It's like, hey, this is how to eat so that you feel good about yourself, but you're also not restricted. We don't, or here's how to exercise. Um, that, it's devoid of any formal education. So I think most people fail until they figure it out. And our hope is that we can provide even like little nuggets of wisdom to make kids feel a bit more in control of those choices that they make. And part of why we felt like we had unique perspectives to bring to this as human beings, as people, not necessarily as professionals, though undoubtedly our experience with high school age kids, our experience with packaging stories, all of that's very relevant, was that we had very extreme different yeah. experiences in college. So while she showed up and was like, we're gonna be professional. I was like <laughs> in the gates, ready to get out of my parents' house and have the freedom that I always wanted to do whatever I wanted to do when I wanted to do it. And so my uh, struggles that I ran into were on the other end of the spectrum. I could right. not wait to have the social life of my choosing and to party when I wanted to party. And all of the things that I had been kind of complaining about or more rather excited to leave which was the structural impositions as I saw them of you've got to be at this practice and you've got to wake up at this time and my mom's telling me I got to do this like what I could not wait for the most was that freedom to make all those choices and then it turns out I was terrible at making <laughs> choices uh, in order to keep me going in the right track because all those structures were removed and it was all up to me and I just kind of kept falling on my face over and over again. And so what I needed to learn, which again, for me, didn't really come until I would say late 20s, maybe even early 30s, was having systems in place for me and for nobody else about what I'm going to do, how I'm going to structure my day to make sure I get done the things I need to get done so that I'm not stressed out about the fact that they're not done. Right. 
Um, and then I've got time to do whatever it is that I personally want to do on the flip side. So that was kind of why we thought, you know what, while we don't want to be the only voices represented in this book, our personal experiences of failure specifically are wonderful comedic entry points <laughs> yeah. to broader topics that we've all got to deal with. Yeah. And I think a, a lot of people who have gone to school with both of the anecdotal stories that you're telling would have a connection to that. They're, the majority of people that go to college, or maybe even if they're not going to college, but they decide to do something where they're leaving the safety of the four walls of their parents' home after they graduate when they're a legal adult, they find themselves in that situation. I mean, there are a small portion of people that maybe do not have that experience. I don't think anyone actually goes through college and it's perfect, you know, the perfect uh, beeline. Well, I, mean, like, I, mean, I have it all planned out. I have straight A's. I'm not drinking excessively. Like, no, no one does that. I was SpongeBob, bong hits, <laughs> and, uh, you know, Bud Ice, 8.30 in the morning for most of my uh, freshman, sophomore years. So yeah. it's like... Yeah. No, none of us have it figured out right <laughs> now. No, nobody has it figured out. I mean, I'm just saying there are some people that maybe, you know, they. No. <laughs> okay, none Jason, <laughs> I have to say, though, when I was young, when I was very young, even when I was like 14, my mom was like, you probably could have moved out and, and lived on your own, yeah. basically. Like, yeah. there, there my, are my so parents people... didn't say that to me, by the way. <laughs> my, mine either. Mine either. I think our ladies have something in common that we yeah, don't. Yeah, She's yeah. had planners her entire life. She oh. just fill them up and fill oh, them but up. Don't, but don't yeah. get it twisted. I was out of control. I was a wild, out of control child. Sorry, family, if you're listening to this. But... <laughs> But anyway, the majority of people understand what you're saying and we come up against this. It's like if you imagine a tennis ball in a tennis court, people are playing tennis back and forth. Well, when that ball goes over the the edge of the fence and it's out of control and there's nothing to contain it, it's like, well, where is it going to go? What's it going to do? I mean, and you imagine all of these high school students as little tennis balls out in the world, ping-ponging all over the place. It's like they don't have that container Totally. To, There's to no ball boy for them, Shug. What no. do you think? No. <laughs> Be your own ball boy. Be your own ball boy, yeah. What Be do you own. think is the biggest hurdle that you see? I mean, we're talking about this as, you know, there's no structure. Is it that all of a sudden people have access to alcohol in a way they didn't have mm. before? Is it that the time management piece is on someone else's shoulders? Is it all of it combined? I mean, what do you think is like the biggest hurdle? I think, so what's interesting when you look at the data, um, cause there's so much now in the news just about mental health struggles among college students. And there was a statistic that we found that was pretty shocking, which was 88% of students feel overwhelming stress about academics. Um, which is obviously a pretty big part of the college experience. And then behind academics, it was like, I won't remember the exact numbers, but 70% about sleep and 60% um, intimate relationships. So that, you know, and then finances, those were like the top four sources of stress. Um, but when you dig into that more and you try to get to the bottom of like, well, why do you feel the stress? It, something, something like 80% of kids were like, oh, because I'm procrastinating. And so they, they acknowledge both sides of it. It's that all of it feels overwhelming and feels like too much. And yet they have no idea. They're owning the fact that they're not doing what they should, but they have no experience putting some rules into place for themselves because like, why would they, unless they'd gone away without their parents? Yeah. You know, I was going to even say summer camp, but that's not even true because a situation like that is all scheduled. So one of the things we really tried to do in the book was kind of reframe it for them and be like, why would you know how to do this? You've had no experience to do it um, and remove any feeling that they might have of judgment. Because I think health books in general, I've read a lot of them. Dave has read a lot of them, not just for researching this book, but just for general, like, you know, self-help in your 20s, trying to be a better person. And most of them, I leave feeling really shitty about myself or one of two things really badly about the choices I've made or super fired up and like, I'm going to change everything tomorrow. And neither of those are productive. So what we tried to give in the book was a, like, you know, you shouldn't feel bad about this because nobody's prepared you for this transition and you haven't had a chance to practice it. And also be like, this takes time. You're not going to solve everything tomorrow. So pick one little thing and start getting after it. So 
So I think the, the big thing is they are so willing to own their shortcomings. It's just that they're not really taught how to find solutions. Um, and that's what's so great about high school and college kids. And that's why I've always loved working with that age group is like they, they want to do better. They want to change. They're open to it. They're not set in their ways. It's just trying to give them information in a way that they don't feel like resistant to because it's being pushed on them in a way that feels preachy. And so that was always something that felt important to us is like, don't make them feel like they're being attacked or told what to do. Well, because most of the health solutions that are in the media or books that come out, they're unrealistic expectations that are set for you. It's like, you're going to be a new you. You just got to change everything about you. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I can do that, Mike, for like five days, but I'm never going to touch it again after five days, right? And so it's, uh, it's this idea that health is this kind of moving target. And it's not because the things you need to put into place, like regular exercise or eating healthy things most of the time, so you can eat whatever you want some of the time. It's not that that information is moving or changing. It's that you are moving and changing with the ebbs and flows of your life because any kind of dogma of I, can't, I will never eat sugar again, ever. Like you're not gonna live up to that. And so it's not helpful to have this feeling of I'm being judged because everything you're telling me in this book about what I need to do to feel good about myself is unrealistic, right? It's the fact that you will fail, that we all fail. And it's more important to hear from a lot of people, here's where I failed. And then here's right. what I did a little differently. And here's kind of how I look at it right now, but it's not coming at uh, taking care of yourself like uh, it's this, you know, forever changed thing. It will always be a struggle. So if you just pick one thing and then work on that, and now you know how to do that, you're not even gonna keep doing that all the time, right. but you'll know how to do it when you fall off the wagon and you're like, all right, maybe I shouldn't eat ice cream for three nights in a row because we're out of ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> you know. I, I love how you both contextualize that because it's, it's very much an analogy even for how we all live life. Like no single person has it figured out. Like point me to that person that has it figured out and that we should all emulate our lives after. We're all on different paths. So of course, if you're quote unquote, like preaching something to someone else, it may not resonate with them because it's like, well, that's not necessarily my path. And I can't adopt that because it doesn't, it doesn't resonate. It doesn't feel right. So just taking like one small aspect and working on that, that's, that feels more approachable. It's like, it's not even that you're going to conquer it. Like you said, you know, if you, if you live in this binary of extremes of like, I will never do this again. And I will only do this. It's like, okay, well, yeah. Like point me to the one person maybe in the world that that's worked out for, you know, right. it's like, it just, it's hard for all of us. If you're, if you're a parent and you have children that are getting ready, maybe they're just about high school age. So you have some time to begin to give them some tools what are a few, like maybe your top three that you think are beneficial to turn the opportunity into a place where they could thrive? You know, everybody's on their own path. Everybody makes their own mistakes, but it's like as parents, I want to give you enough freedom so that you can begin to explore this yourself, but you know, you're, you are still my child, so I'm responsible for you. I can't let you just go like buck wild in the world. So how do you, I, how I do, you do that? I can give yeah, one. I think, I you, you know, what I've seen in coaching and teaching that can be really empowering for kids is when parents give them responsibility early on, like ninth grade of you're the one that's in charge of communicating with your coach or your teachers. You're the one that's responsible for letting me know when I'm supposed to get you to practice or pick you up putting them in charge of their schedule so they have ownership over that responsibility and they're used to that small portion of time management and communication is really important because I still sometimes have to kind of push parents, even of seniors off who are texting me and they're like, well, what time is the bus tomorrow? I'm like, well, I told, I told your kid, you know, three days ago, what time the bus was like, that's their job to communicate with you. And so I think just you know, when parents can empower their kids to be the main source of communication between the other adults in their life, 
that needs to be something they are very comfortable doing when they get to college. Um, communicating with all parts and, you know, all parties involved, their parents, but as well as the administrators and the RAs and the professors, et cetera. So that's one small thing that I think as soon as kids start high school, they should be responsible for as much time management and as much communication of their responsibilities as as possible for the family. And piggybacking on that note, giving your kids planned, unstructured time at an early age so that they start to wrap their minds around what am I going to do? How am I going to do this? And that way, the first time that they're met with your schedule is completely empty and whatever you're going to do is completely up to you. Isn't the summer after their senior year where now they're trying to figure out, well, what do I even do? Like, who am I? And what do I do and what makes me happy? And on the flip side of that, I think like a really underutilized, um, skill set that can be provided if we break these things into proactive and reactive, right? Is when you don't feel great, what are a list of things that we can go through and you can make some choices? So maybe it's going for a walk, or maybe it's listening to a podcast, or maybe it's, you know, going outside or going for a hike. The answer is going to be different for everybody, but letting your kids understand that there will be times where you don't feel great. And there are things that you can do when you're in that moment and starting the process of what are my coping skills so that when I find myself in a place where I don't feel great, the odds of getting stuck in the feedback loop spiral decrease. And maybe I'm going to call one of my friends because I know whenever I talk to my friend, I feel better. Those type of skill sets tend to be underdeveloped. Um, Mm -hmm. If they're not given an opportunity to start thinking about it for themselves. So it's less about, you do this, put that jigsaw puzzle together. That's going to make you happy. <laughs> and I, more. I kinda, yeah. I'm sorry. I kind of wish you guys were my parents. Honestly. <laughs> I, I went out to school. I had nothing. I had no plan, no nothing. But I'm sorry. Go on. I didn't no, mean to. No, no, not because because again, like and, and you said it before, I truly believe it, that this is applicable to anybody. It doesn't yeah. matter how old you are. You're all you're going to be doing this in your life. And so the more you can start wrapping your mind around What is it that I like to do that makes me happy? That's a question that could floor most adults I know. Oh my God. My my runners asked me this morning, they're like, what do you do for fun? And I was like, uh, (laughs) and then I was like, they're going to have terrible ideas about what adulthood is if I can't come up with something. So I was like, I like to walk. (laughs) Yeah, we've been been asking ourselves that constantly lately with the the one-year-old we're just, and and the three and a half year old. And we're just like, what, you know, like, are we fun? Like, we're not really fun, are we? (laughs) We yeah. are fun. Yeah. Let's yeah. get that fun back. But that's I, that's for another podcast, I think. I <laughs> still feel episode. like I could be fun, you know? Yeah. I feel like that's a thing I could be. I, I have fun, fun potential. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> one of the things um, that I think is applicable to all levels of being a parent and being a person is the we're so used to overscheduling ourselves and overscheduling our kids. And I had, we had a great conversation with some of my runners this weekend, reflecting on COVID and just what they've learned from that year and a half. And um, man, it was sad, you know, talking to these kids who were like, I liked COVID because they, it was like, I had time to do my classes and then paint for a few hours or like start writing, you know, noodling around on instruments and writing music. And, and they had developed hobbies that they had never had a chance to do because from early on they had school and then extracurriculars and then family time. And it was just all packed. And um, I think the thing that they are mourning, and there are some of them who are mourning the loss of that socialization and those rites of passage. But a lot of the girls we talked to were just like, I miss having time to do what I want to do. And uh what a good lesson, right? For all of us to not, re- not lose that, that, you know, we've started as parents trying to one day every weekend, like we don't do anything. And that means we have to turn down plans and make our friends think that we hate them. And we're like, no, no, no. We just, we just don't want to do anything. Um, which is, you know, it's a hard thing to stand up for, but I think the importance of learning how to like, you know, just chill, just relax and be okay with that space and that time is it's hard for me. Like, but I've really, I think in COVID learned, man, I enjoyed my weekends way more when I looked at them and I was like, we have nothing tomorrow. And just trying to hold on to that as a parent, trying to hold on to that for your kids and make that space for them. Um, 
like our kid is looking at going to school in a few years. And I'm already looking at that being like, that's a long day for a six year old to be in school. And, uh, and so just, you know, I think being mindful of how much we overschedule kids and giving them space to kind of do some things that they can schedule themselves that are not for any, like Dave said it earlier, not for anybody other than them so that they can figure out what makes them happy and how they want to spend their time. And, you know, going to college for the first time, you've got a lot of other things to balance. Knowing what makes you happy shouldn't have to be, that's a big thing, right? You should hopefully figure that out beforehand. And so trying to provide opportunities for that um, feels really important. And we've heard that with a lot of parents, friends too, of like, well, you know, we've got Simon's in karate and Amelia's starting her swim lessons <laughs> next week. And it's like the, the solution for how do I make my kids happy has somehow turned into, I've got to give them all of these things that will just make them happy, you know, when at the end of the day, they're like, my iPad's not playing the show I want to watch. <laughs> Daddy, I got a question. How do I pull this back up? And it's not, obviously we can't just like do that for an entire day, but you know, I, d I don't necessarily think that over scheduling is going to uh, provide them with what we think it's going to provide them for for an overly simplistic kind of view on it. Well, it makes it, like you said, like we said, it makes it difficult to learn how to schedule if you've always been scheduled. And it's tough too as parents because you want to be able to nurture your child's interests. And when they're very young, you don't really know what those interests oh. are yet. So you're like, okay, well, let's try horseback riding and let's try swim lessons and let's try music class. And then there, then there becomes a time where if they do find interest in some of these, you are packing their schedule so tight. And we see, we yeah. have friends and family members who have children that are a little bit older because like with a one and a three-year-old, like we have, you know, you, you can't quite, I mean, you could do that now, but yeah. it, it's a little bit more difficult with like nap times and everything else. Yeah. But, uh, as, as kids get older and they're in school and then as soon as school's finished and it's like after school activities up until bedtime, that's a lot. That that's is a lot. lot. And homework too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it would be like as adults, like if you worked in an office and then as soon as you left your office, you're like, well, I got to go to yoga and then I have art class after that. And then I got to <laughs> eat dinner and go. To, it's like, that's a lot every day. It's like, yeah. Yeah. okay, wow. That, that's packed in tight. I think that the the balance there is probably it's hard. And let's say that you're speaking to a group of parents that maybe have children that are younger, right? Mm -hmm. Not, not ninth grade and above or college and above, but sure. if the kids are younger, have you seen as students come into your realm, like let's say that they, maybe they had parents that didn't schedule them as crazy mm -hmm. and then they get to you have you seen the difference in that with students? I mean, can you can you touch on that or like any advice you would have to parents of how do we balance that? I don't know if there, you know, there's probably not a right answer here, but just any suggestions. Yeah, I you know, it's funny. I was talking with one of the girls the other day who comes from that type of family where she was scheduled from sun up to sundown and she was one of the ones who was sort of lamenting that COVID, you know, that it's it was so open and then instantly like a switch flipped and they were back to the grind. And she was commenting on the fact that like her coping skills for being that busy had sort of atrophied. And so I do think that there is some value in kids being, I, I don't want to use the word stress, but being like pushed to be engaged in things and to, to try something and not quit it and to see it through to the end. We just had our son hates soccer. We just signed him up for soccer. Turns out he could not dislike it more. And the, the athlete and coach and both of us was like, oh, this is killing us. You just got to <laughs> just play the game. Um, but it was not his thing. And so, but we forced him to see it through. And we were like, we know you don't like practice. It's an hour, like giddy up and you're done in six weeks and you know, you'll be glad you did it. And he wasn't glad he did it, but we were like, <laughs> maybe you've learned something. So my point is, I think it's good for kids to have these engagements. And I think it's good for them to, you know, feel what it's like to be busy because realistically, that's life like that never really lets up. I mean, you guys are parents. There's a reason we don't have things that are fun anymore in our lives because you literally just don't have time. 
I have two things that are fun in my life. <laughs> my two kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's perfect. What, what about oh, me? And they're fun like yeah. 60% of the time. Um, <laughs> but so I think there is something about strengthening those muscles in kids that's important so that when life is unrelenting, which it will be, they are prepared to handle it and they know how to cope. And so I do think that the freedom that was provided by COVID was too much in the opposite direction. There was too much unscheduled time and not enough. There wasn't enough like push um, and it made it really hard for them to come back to it. But I do think that every kid is different and what every kid needs is gonna be different. And some can really thrive on being scheduled from sun up to sundown. And that's how they you know, derive happiness is by a lot of you know, production and creativity or you know, completion of things. Um, but I think it's just about finding the balance that feels like it's right for your kid where they are, they're being pushed and they're, you know, at the bottom of it all, I think is, are they being motivated by something that makes them happy or by something that makes you happy um, as a parent? And we write about that in the book, that intrinsic motivation. And I think if there's anything to work on with kids that you can do from early on, it's getting them to be proud of whatever it is they're doing. And I think in that, you do have to provide some opportunities for challenge. Like our kid could sit in his room in his underwear and play Legos all day. He'd probably be happy. But would he be proud of himself at the end of it? It's like you need to provide some opportunities for adversity, um, but just be mindful about not hammering them with those opportunities because that's exhausting and giving them ways to be proud of themselves that aren't dependent on praise and grades and other sort of tangible rewards because that's the stuff that will serve them as they become adults well and when you're trying to foster interests for kids like well you know you can't you can't argue that like access and opportunity are important i might be really good at shooting a bow and arrow but how am i ever going to know unless i i'm given that kind of opportunity to explore that totally. right but i think the um the the tendency to try and schedule our kids with X, Y, and Z. So we're providing all of that at the same time. There might be a way to gauge interest level by like sitting together on the couch and totally. watching a documentary about like a sharpshooting archer or something, or, or watching a documentary about like some big wave surfer. Maybe that's a little too dangerous. <laughs> we just saw one of those the other, it's like a hundred foot wave. We're like, oh my God, look at this kind of thing. But Daddy, that looks like fun. <laughs> I wanna but, try that. But there may be a way to collectively point and look at something together and see, is this, you know, something that you would like to try rather than like, I've made these decisions for you right. and you're going to do X, Y, Z. And by the way, youth soccer is crazy. If you think about like the first level of soccer where all the drills are like, put your foot on the ball and do this very simple expectation, right? Kick the ball through your mom or dad's leg. Very simple like expectations. And then they're like, okay, everybody go crazy and go run after the ball. And it just, it turns into chaos. And our son just looked at us and was like, what is this? Like, I don't need to be a part of whatever is happening right now. Cause she's crying and he's kicking her and like, you know, <laughs> does it make, anyways, I digress a little bit, but I, I feel like that's a good way where you can try a lot of things mm. by experiencing exposure. them together. Just the exposure to the idea rather than like, so I got your fall lineup all figured out and we're going to be doing X, Y, and Z, you know? The intrinsic motivation piece is really such a key. I think like that almost seems like it's the crux of it all. It's like, where does that come from within you? And I think for even us as adults, we have to figure out, you know, are we intri intrinsically motivated to get our our tasks that are in front of us in life completed. And if not, and if there's a lot of fear, we'll come up against even more procrastination, procrast procrastination, Ooh. which is what you were sharing. I mean, if you think about the switch that we've seen with working from home for so many people, many companies didn't offer that because they didn't quite trust yeah. employees and why wouldn't they trust employees well are people intrinsically motivated if somebody's not looking over their shoulder watching them so it's almost like as adults we understand what this feels like so how do we cultivate an environment for our children so that they don't feel like we're always looking over their shoulder like are you completing what you should complete but do you have that within you 
to pursue what makes you happy and also pursue what doesn't make you happy. Like the grit that you're talking about, because there are, you know, probably 75% of what you're faced with just in the reality of the world we live in. It's not necessarily something that's like, oh my God, I just love logging on to the electric company site and just making sure my payment has gone through. It's like, fun. Like that just, I mean, it's, it's like, great. The lights are turn, turned on and it's paid. Woohoo. I, you know, woo. Yay. Like that's wonderful. I love that aspect of it, but you know, does that bring me joy? I don't know. You know, and it's like, how, how do you get them there? I think even when kids are really young, that, that space of not having scheduled time and figuring out what they like. I mean, you gave the examples of sitting down to watch a documentary or even just noticing and paying attention as parents to what your kids find interest in and giving them that time and space to, yeah. to cultivate it. I saw a quote the other day. There was actually a survey. It was like, what do kids um, crave the most? And uh, it was a New York Times columnist. And it was basically like the approval of their parents. They want to make their parents proud. And her take was that we need to rewrite the narrative and get kids to ask themselves, what do you do that makes you proud? Take your parents out of it. And I wonder if it's as simple as that. It's just, it's just asking different questions or giving praise in different ways. And, you know, getting them to think about what are the things that like you really like working hard for? Um, you know, as a, as a running coach, I think one of the greatest things about that sport is kids learn to love hard work because when they do something that's scary and they succeed and they come out on the other side, they're like, oh my gosh, I didn't think I could do that. And I feel so good about myself. And it was, it was not because I clapped for them when they got finished. It was because they conquered something inside of their self, which was fear. You nailed it. It's like they were afraid and they wanted to avoid it and they didn't. And they saw how that made them feel. And so I think the more opportunities we can provide kids to have that safe challenge and get them to think about how it made them feel, not how it made anyone else feel. Um, and just making, it doesn't have to be worded as intrinsic motivation, but just flipping the script so they, they can start tapping into those feelings and being mindful um, and aware. That awareness, I think, when you're so busy, that awareness is so easily lost um, that that understanding of how you feel because there's so much other distraction and just getting kids to pay attention to like, how do I feel when, my, when I clean my room and I look around and like, I did it and I didn't want to do it, but I did it. And um, our four-year-old cleaned his room last week and he was so excited to show us and he didn't want to do it. Um, and I think, again, just like providing opportunities for things that are challenging and then helping them recognize how doing hard things make them feel is as I've seen work at all levels um, with our little kids, as well as with high school kids. I heard ta Coats Coates talk once about controlled adversity and how it was such an awesome thing to like provide controlled adversity for his kids to deal with. And at the time it was like, he moved to France to write a book because some people can do that. And <laughs> he was like, he was like, my, uh, my son wanted to go somewhere. And I was like, go use the subway, figure it out. He's like, I don't speak French. He's like, I don't care, go figure it out. Now that's a little like, potentially dangerous and I get that, right? But the other night, um, you know, my son was like, I really want a piece of candy. <laughs> and we had a we had a predetermined deal. We had a deal, right? And the deal, <laughs> the deal was you eat all of your plate and you can have a piece of candy, right? Now that's the deal, we talked about this. And he starts bawling and he's like, but I hate squash. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well then don't eat the squash that's fine. You don't have to eat the squash. He's like, but I want the candy. And I'm like, okay, well then eat the squash and you, and you can have the candy. But like, uh, you know, he's like bawling, but this thing going off and it's, I don't think it's masochistic, but this thing went off in my head. I was like, oh, this is great. Like I'll sit in this, I'll sit in this for a minute. I'll do this all night, mm -hmm. man. Like you, you, you want to keep going back and forth. And it did get pretty sad because he's like, I don't know what to do. And I was like, all right, you want me to, you want me to tell you what to do? He's like, yeah. I'm like, eat the squash. <laughs> but I don't want to eat the squash. So I was like, great, don't eat the squash. But that means, and this like, this went on for He videotaped time. it. It went on for 20 minutes. Our daughter, oh was, our daughter was actually like about to take her first step. So that's why this is all happening. I'll send you- It could still video. be going on right now. <laughs> it could still be going on right now. I'll send you the video. It's actually pretty funny. Um, but it's, it's those kinds of things that like, and I, 
I hate listening to people give advice. So I feel bad even just kind of saying this type of stuff, right? Because a lot of times as a dad, I can speak for myself. It is so stressful when things are not like going to well, just do the thing, like what do the thing. And, you know, uh, when you can step back and be like, is there any way I can personally detach my emotion from this? <laughs> cool. Like if I can do that, great. Yep. And is this an opportunity to like deal with some low stakes adversity yeah. where it's not like, don't run into the street. You know, it's not high stakes, it's low stakes mm -hmm. adversity. And like, let's just sit in this for a little bit. Yep. And it's not to say that like the outcome will be there, but the, the experience, the muscle memory, the practice of like I'm dealing with something I don't want to do. And then making not like overly, but making a big deal about it mm. when it's over. Like, this is over, dude. Yeah, you, you got this. Like, aren't you, mm -hmm. you know, that, that kind of thing that fosters that feeling that we're talking about of it's not, it's maybe a little too heady for a two or three or four year old to wrap their minds around it. But like, I didn't want to do this, but I did it. And now it's over. Mm. And how do you feel about that? You know? Well, and a concept, we don't really play around with it too much in the book, but it's something that we use at home is the concept of earning it. Our son every day has to earn his screen time by doing, it's literally three things where like you have to listen, you have to be polite and you have to help. And those things end up being actually really nice overarching things. Like when he's- Listen you, covers a lot. It really way. does. And be polite covers a lot. Um, <laughs> but that's, that's an important idea, I think, for kids of all levels to get into is like, you know, getting through the things they don't want to do to be like, Phew, I did it. And now I've earned a chance to like watch TV or I've earned a chance to, you know, socialize with my friends. It's not that it has to be that type of, you know, work reward system always, but that's how you beat that procrastination is being like, there's a carrot on the other side of this. I just got to do the things I don't want to do. Um, and learning that is, takes practice. It's a skill of being like, I, I don't want to do these things that I got to do. It's like, you're talking about paying the electric bill, but like, I need to cross it off my list so I can stop thinking about it and do some things that are more fun. And uh, I feel like that's a thing that you can start teaching from an early age that would have served me well as a college student of just being like, I'm going to earn, earn the time to do the things I want to do by doing the things that I have to do first. If you could leave the audience, if they're a parent that has a child that's, you know, heading into college, or even maybe if they're a young person, a shout out to any, you know, like 17 year olds that are listening to this. We love you. <laughs> if they're about to head into college, what's like a key takeaway from your book that you would want to leave them mm. with? I think I have one. Uh, I'll, have I'll one. go first. Okay. The, you know, part of the messaging that kids get when they go off to this college, did I just steal yours? No, it's perfect. I'm glad uh, you did. Part of the messaging that they get when they go off to college is this is going to be the best four years of your life, right? <laughs> And, and what they find out when they get there, what all of the kids that we surveyed for quotes for our book relayed in some way, shape or form, form is that it's really hard. It's really hard. And that's okay, right? And that message tends to get lost when especially the world we live in of social media of like, look at me and look at what I'm doing and look at how great my life is. A lot of times what's really going on with people is a never communicated, but more importantly, what I'm feeling as the individual who's looking at this screen and judging myself is that my experience isn't reflected in the world mm. that I'm seeing. Mm. Right. And so that idea that it's going to be hard, but there are lots of things set up to help you. If you can just get pointed in the right directions and have a few kind of backup plan, backup plan things in place so that when you encounter adversity, and when you're not sure what to do, you know that it's not on you to figure it all out, that mm -hmm. everybody goes through this. Yeah. And I was just going to say that uh, I think one of the things that can be so tricky with social media, particularly when you leave your high school friends and you're going to college to make new friends, is you see like, well, Dave's posting pictures with his 10 new best friends. And I was Dave's like high school best friend. And like, I feel like he's moved on and we're, you know, that relationship isn't important to him anymore. It's just so easy to take social media at face value and feel like the, the relationships that you had beforehand now have been replaced by something bigger and better at a new school. And I think the more kids can just accept um, that vulnerability is really valuable and to talk to each other honestly and be like, man, I'm actually like really hating college or it's been really hard for me to find friends that I can connect with or I'm just not okay. 
Um, I hope that they learned some skills from COVID of how to cope and, and how to be honest about their emotions. But I think that's the biggest takeaway is college might also be a mix of some of like the lowest points of your life because so much is different and you've lost the familiar structures that have kind of kept you grounded and, you know, felt supported. Um, and so if the lowest lows happen among the highest highs, like it's going to be both the best and the worst times of your life possibly in that four years. And that's so normal and that it's okay to not have it be okay all the time. And I think there is such panic among kids when they feel like, well, my experience sucks because I know it so intimately, but it seems like everybody else is fine. And just understanding like not everybody else is fine. Not everybody else's adults is fine. We all are, are guilty of only posting the best parts on social media. And this is, it's the, it's the narrative that exists. Like we all know that, that it tends to be a glamorization, but I think you're so susceptible in college to feeling really awful about it because you don't, you don't have your, you know, a partner where you can be like, but I know your experience, like we're in this together. Um, you kind of lose that if you go into it on your own. And so it's just really easy to feel isolated. But in that isolation, recognize that there is a universal feeling of that among all of your peers. And so it's like you're all swimming in that same, you know, garbage water together and you will get out the other side. It just it's a it's a tough man. The 20s, like all of it. 20s suck. And the beginning of that is college and just like accepting it will it will get better. And um, that's part of the transition to becoming an, an independent adult. Uh, it's just all part of it. And w one last quick practical tip too, because I think it's important, is that in your notes, in your phone, yeah. make a list of five people that know you, that love you, that care about you. It could be a friend, could be a family member, could be a coach, could be a teacher. Because when you're in a place where the new world I've gone to sucks and you want to step out of that for a second, it's harder to think of what can I do? Who can I call? What do I want to talk to? You already have that list pre-made. So you can call that one person that will be happy to hear from you and will give you some kind of uh, experience that's not rooted in everything that you're going through and that new best friend you found out is a piece of garbage and all that kind of <laughs> stuff, right? Uh, but that's just a quick thing you can do. It doesn't take a lot of time because when you're low, you're rarely like, oh, now I've got all the ideas for what I'm going to do to be better. <laughs> yeah. And the more you can do to be kind of prepared, A, that that will happen, and B, I've got a quick solution, so yeah. I don't have to think. Yeah. I'm just going to call my brother because I love talking to him. It's awesome. Any resources that you would want to point someone to? Um, I'm going to give a shout out to another book that has a shockingly similar title to ours <laughs> um, called The Ultimate Student Health Handbook. Um, it's by a, somebody who's become a dear friend of ours named Jill Grimes. She's a doctor. It's think of ours as like the prep that you might read before you go to college. Hers is like the alternative to Googling. Uh, it's like an encyclopedia of all things health related. You're going to experience in college where you can just flip to a page and be like, what do I do? And she's super cool. Um, and it words it very similar to ours in like a really casual way, but she's a doctor. So you're like, oh yeah, you're legit. I trust what you're saying. And so and it's less fear inducing than Googling, like I have, you know, pain in my shin and it's like your whole leg is now gangrene and it's going to need to be cut off. Um, so that's a great resource. And again, it's a book. So, you know, it's, some kids are scared of books, but I think as a parent, that's a really easy thing to send in a care package that they can just have sitting by them as a resource. Um, that's probably one of my favorites. And then our book, obviously, just as the preparation or the reset, I would be Silly of me not to plug it, but I think that um, that the can you know the combination of those two things it, it's both the preparation and also the gut reaction when things aren't going great. Do you have other that you can think uh, of? Just a general direction that whatever it is you're interested in, if you want to learn how to do pottery or if you feel like uh, yeah. you want to be a cinematographer or whatever, if you have some kind of interest where you're like that career path seems fascinating to me and I'd like to know more. There are more uh, and great podcasts now than have ever existed yeah. in terms of I can take a deep dive and hear somebody's life story, right? So it's less about give me the bullet points and it's more about I'm listening to this person tell me, mm -hmm. walk me through how they started, what their childhood was like, so I can get an idea of why they look at the world the way mm -hmm. that they look at the world, rather than thinking that. Um, again, the, the bullet points of surrealism is everything I need to know about that chapter to pass the test. It's like, pick the artist, pick Dolly. Where did mm. he come from? 
what was his childhood like? What were the people that shaped the way that he looked at the world? And so you, you can do so much with your own self-education nowadays because information is just out there and available that that also happens to be a way to foster those interests that are outside of the obligations you got to do for school, you got to do for work. But like, what do I like to do when I, what makes me happy to help answer those questions? You can start self-guided trips down those roads yeah. that don't require anybody else's guidance other than, you know, searching through an app. Basically. Well, and to bring it full circle and make it feel less depressing, all of those artists that he talked about who have like made it, none of them have had it easy. It's interesting to be like, oh yeah, everybody's journey is rocky. And like, there's a lot to learn from that. So I think that makes it feel less sad that college can be hard. It's like, it's just a part of the path and there's a lot to learn from that struggle. Yeah. Point me to the, all the people that have had it super easy. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and give, give yourselves a shout out. Where can everyone find your book? Say the title again, social handles. Go so our book, we can, um, it's on Amazon. It's on Barnes and Noble. It's at a lot of indies. So, uh, if you like to support indies, which hopefully we all do, that's a great place to get it. But if you Amazon it, it'll be at your house like in five hours. So that's an option too. Um, and social media, we need to be more active, but to, at two coach Henry's is our account. It's a lot of pictures of our kids and some, you know, of our snaggle tooth dog. Um, and then we've got an account at greatest college health guide on Instagram, um, where we post some tidbits, some wisdom, it's going to be more articles coming up. Um, but hopefully is supposed to serve more as really an educational resource where the other one is more just like us living. <laughs> and we want to know when you're moving to France to write your next book. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that would be the dream. Really, it's funny you talked about it. If we get a chance to do another one, we really want to write one for new parents because that's another gigantic How life. How to take care of you. Yeah. Right? Yeah, not your kids. Not There's your, enough books about that. Yeah, um, they'll be fine. Well, you guys got to write that soon because we're running out of time. To read that. I know, right? <laughs> we need to figure out how to do it first, not yeah, write yeah, it, yeah, but right. how to actually take well, care we of ourselves. Lots of, we have lots of failures to pull from. Yeah, exactly. Like the we do too. Kind of in place. <laughs> we know people who can weigh in with their own ideas about like, yeah, yeah I see it. I see it. <laughs> yeah, we will happily give our uh, yeah. feedback. It doesn't even have to be anonymous. Yeah, right. <laughs> Love that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jill awesome. and Dave, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you we for appreciate us. you coming on and sharing this. I think maybe if you're a parent out there and you're like, I don't know if this is for me. I don't know if I need this. My kids are young. Just the, you know, probably even the few first pages that I read of this, I just received my copy. Thank you so much. It is, like you mentioned, completely applicable to me in my life mm -hmm. as an adult right now. So even if you think like, oh, I don't know if this is for me, there is something here as a takeaway for everyone, no matter what your age is. As a Absolutely. parent, you could apply it to young children. And as a person who maybe doesn't have children, you could still read this and apply this to your life. And even as adults, regardless of your age, like we said, like none of us have this figured out. So it's just one more helpful resource that really gives you this baseline of, understanding and a, a way to approach life so you're not floundering which i everybody could use that <laughs> and it's a huge accomplishment for you guys to have put together such a beautiful professional book being new parents too like i don't know how the hell you Thanks, have time man. to do something Thanks, like this man. i mean so i don't what? have time to sleep i don't have time yeah. to pee like i <laughs> yeah. wear diapers depends i can't do anything and you yeah. guys found time to write this beautiful like 300 page book with like uh, it's, it's amazing there's Thanks, a lot of man. fights. Oh. We, uh, it turns out like working together on a project like this was, uh, we have different work styles. And so we managed, but, uh, yeah, it was, it's an, it's an accomplishment because we managed it and we still like love each other on the other side, which. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's mean, a man. testament to true love right there. That's awesome. Yeah, man. Yeah, <laughs> Something man. like that. Well, thank you both when you find time to write your next book, even if it's not in France. We definitely want to have you back to talk about oh, that. This is it. awesome. Thank Bye. you both so much. And thank you for joining us to Elevate the Vibe. Thanks again for having us. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Bye. Hey there, Vibe Hive babes. If this podcast has brought you any value, please rate and review on your favorite listening platform. And if you're feeling really generous, share with a friend. 
Visit us at elevatethevibe.co for show notes on this episode and previous episodes. This podcast is intended to educate, entertain, and inspire. It is not intended to diagnose, treat, or substitute for professional medical advice. Please consult your healthcare provider with any questions you may have. And as always, thank you for joining us to Elevate the Vibe.